he had been in this garden before. It was a quiet place to pray. But this night would be different. It would begin the culmination of God's masterful plan. Jesus wrestled with what was to happen. Yet he submitted and said to God, Not my will, but yours be done. Jeremy, we've come to the Church of All Nations, which sits on the traditional site of the Garden of Gethsemane on the eastern side of Jerusalem. Now, obviously it's closed. It's dark, we're not gonna be able to get in. And it looks a lot different than it would have when Jesus was here. We've got modern city streets, cars, lights, but if we can imagine what that would have been like after Jesus' final Passover meal with the disciples, they have sung their songs, Jesus has prayed for them, as recorded over in John, and then they come up here for Jesus to pray multiple times. What's one of the reasons that coming out at night is so important, especially looking back to Jerusalem? Well, understanding that when Jesus and his disciples were here, it would have been dark. They didn't have the lights that we have today. They would have been able to see the walls of Jerusalem, and they would have been able to see the gates. And John tells us about the army coming out with their lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus would have been able to see that from here. Now that's really heightened by this dark atmosphere. It's gonna be great to get in there and see what that looked like. We'll do that tomorrow. Jesus had the reputation of going to that spot, to that garden to pray. And he knew what was happening that night. During the Passover meal, he actually sent Judas out to do what he was going to do. For anybody else, if they knew what was going on, they would have gone to an alternate spot. They would have gone to a spot that was different than the routine to be safe and to keep themselves from harm. But Jesus didn't vary his routine. He still went through with where he normally went, knowing that that's where Judas would find him. I was a little disappointed we couldn't get into the Garden of Gethsemane at night. I understand why, but it's exciting to go back. Yeah, they had a special prayer service going on. Being there in the daytime, we'll have an even a better perspective. We'll be able to see things even clearer than we did last night. It's such an emotional place. I mean, Jesus was so vulnerable when he was in the garden praying the night that he was arrested. I don't even know how to anticipate what that's gonna be like to be there. Jeremy, we've entered the courtyard of the Church of All Nations, which sits on the traditional location of the Garden of Gethsemane. This building was built in the 1920s, and it was built on top of the foundations of a 4th century Byzantine chapel and a 12th century Crusader Basilica. In the first century, there was an oil press here. Of course, in Aramaic, the word Gethsemane means oil press. During the time of Jesus, this would have been the area where they would have crushed all of the olives that come from the olive trees from what we know as the Mount of Olives. There are some cultural ideas about the various numbers of olive pressings. You'd put the olives in and you'd press it and the first pressing went to this and the second pressing went to this and the third pressing would be used for this. And so the fact that Jesus was in an area known for its olive press and that he prays and pours himself out under intense pressure three different times is very significant. This was a place where he was known to go to for just some solitude. And so this is a place where on the night he was betrayed, he felt it was a good place for him to go and talk to his father. And he carried some of the disciples there with him. To be able to walk into a grove of olive trees, especially one as old as the one that we went to, is really special. That whole area is really only about the size of half of a football field. If the church building or the olive trees aren't sitting in the exact location, it's very close. Jesus prayed all through his life, 
prayer was something special for him. He set aside time to make sure to communicate with the Father. This night was especially significant for him. It's just before his betrayal. It's just before his arrest. He comes here to pray three times to ask God if there's any way possible that he could avoid the cross and everything that went along with the cross. The Gospels tell us that Jesus prayed, that he had a habit of praying, that he would go off by himself to pray. But it's not very often that the Gospels give us the words of his prayers. And so to have those words on the eve of such a momentous day is really, really special. And then to understand that it was several times that he offered a very similar prayer. That's how intent he was on it. And the answer was given to him with the light of the torches coming down. The answer was no, this is the way. And he submitted himself to God's will. When he was done with that third prayer, he gathered up his disciples and he made a statement. Matthew and Mark record it for us. He says, rise, let us be going, for my betrayer is at hand. Now, how does he know that? Well, I think there's a possible explanation in John the 18th chapter. In verse one, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden where he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. You remember when we were here last night and it was dark? Mm -hmm. Now picture yourself in that environment with regards to this passage. The gate that you see across the valley here is the Eastern Gate. Now that gate was built in the sixth century, but it sits on the foundations of an earlier gate. Now think about that, a band of soldiers with lanterns and torches coming in at night. Jesus could have easily looked across that valley and seen those people coming. He had the opportunity to do something, but he didn't. He stayed right here for you and me. And we don't know exactly which gate those soldiers came out, but that gate seems logical given its location. Jesus clearly would have seen them maybe for as much as 10 minutes before they arrived there in the Garden of Gethsemane he would have had plenty of time to run. Imagining what you're asking us to think about, the nighttime prayers and being able to see those lit torches from the group that were coming up with weapons to arrest him. And then thinking about the journey that Jesus has already taken. He's already come from heaven, come to earth, taken on flesh. He came all the way down, but this was a trip that he easily could have made if he wanted to. When he saw the threat of danger coming, he could have run off. He could have gone to Bethany over across the top of the Mount of Olives. He could have gone to Bethphage. He could have gone back to Jerusalem. He could have done any number of things, but he didn't take that journey. He stayed and he allowed himself to be arrested and crucified. In the Israel Museum, they have a number of things that relate to the life of Jesus. But one in particular is the ossuary of Caiaphas, the high priest. During that time, when Jewish people died, they would have laid them in a burial chamber and wrapped their body. And after a year, the body itself has decomposed in what's left of the bones. And they would take those bones and put them in an ossuary, a bone box. And they found the ossuary of Caiaphas. They have several ossuaries in that wing, and so you can actually compare. There are some that are very, very simple, and there's actually the ossuary of a crucified man that has a remnant of his ankle bone with the nail still in it. That ossuary is very plain compared to Caiaphas's. Annas and Caiaphas, they were the high priests, and I say that because really Annas was the high priest. According to the Jews, that was a role that you held for the duration of your life. But from the Roman perspective, that was a title they passed along to different people. The way that that political family maintained that role was to make sure that from the Roman perspective, different younger men within the family would rotate the title. But functionally, Annas was the one behind all of that, pulling the strings in the background. What the Gospels explain to us is that the men in that family had actually prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and they had been looking for opportunities to arrest him and kill him. Well, Judas provided that opportunity for them. He uh, approached them and said that he would be able to give Jesus over to them, identify him for them. And so that's exactly what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And of course, Jesus then was arrested and he was brought to the house of Annas and Caiaphas, which would have sat on the Western Hill in the city of Jerusalem. It was a place that was high on the hill. Important people of the city would have lived there and that's the location that we visited.
After Jesus was arrested in the garden, they would have led him up this way to the home of Annas and Caiaphas to begin that night of series of trials to condemn him. Now, we're in a spot that you think is really important to that story. We're at the Church of St. Peter in Gallicantu. And Gallicantu is Latin for the cock crowing. So this is the traditional location of where the house of Annas and Caiaphas was located, the same location where Peter denied Christ while he was here. Now from this spot, I can see the Mount of Olives in a spot just above where the Garden of Gethsemane was. There's an ancient, it looks like a first century road behind us. How would that have played a role in that night? That road led from the upper city to the lower city here in Jerusalem. If you'll notice in the scriptures, Annas and Caiaphas and the people that were here did not seem to be surprised that Jesus showed up in the middle of the night. Right. Well, it's because they could see him coming. From here, you would have the vantage point of being able to see the torches in Gethsemane, and then as they led Jesus here. And this road that's behind us was probably a road that Jesus was led up. Both Annas and Caiaphas could have looked out from their house, and they would have seen those torches go to the garden, and then start making their way back toward them. And they would have known that their plot to arrest Jesus and ultimately kill him was in motion. There's some things inside this building that I think give some credibility to this being an approximate location. Jeremy, look at this door. It's a picture of Jesus, and he's instructing Peter that he's going to deny him three times. And of course, we know Peter does that. Come on inside. Jeremy, one of the reasons why they feel like this could possibly be a location of the house is the fact that they found these fifth century Byzantine mosaics here. And if the Byzantines built a church here, they must have thought this site was important as well. Jeremy, here's a hole in the floor that sits above this holding cell down here. A prisoner would have been let down with ropes into this area. When we get down there, you'll be able to look up and see this from below. So you're saying that the Byzantine church was built on top of this first century dungeon. There are a couple of hours when his trials with Annas and Caiaphas were completed and before the Sanhedrin could meet in the morning, it's likely he could have been held in a place like this. Even for important Jewish leaders, it would have been out of the ordinary for them to have a holding cell down in the bottom of their house. Whoever lived here was someone of importance who would have been in a position that they would have had the need to hold prisoners for either a trial or some sort of hearing. On top of that, you have a number of mikvah, religious baths on the front of the property, which indicates that this person is a person of means, they're a religious person, and other than ordinary people, they have what they perceive to be a need to hold people and restrain them down in the basement. Jeremy, we're down in this holding cell underneath the bottom of this church. You can see up above is a hole that we saw earlier. This would have been the hole that they would have let down a prisoner into this holding cell. This hole was originally a mikvah, which was a ritual bath, but it's obvious that it's been cut deeper for the purpose of holding a prisoner down here. How ironic that a place where they would have been coming down to get ceremonially clean is a place where they would have lowered a prisoner and held them for a while. This would have been a very dark, lonely place for anybody who would have been down here. I've done work in prisons, and in almost every prison, there's a place that they send them for isolation, to cut them off from everybody else. And for anyone who had been lowered down through here, the only way out, a hole in the ceiling 20 feet up, they would have felt completely isolated. And we know Jesus felt similar to that, having all of his closest associates run away from him and give up on him. It would have been a very haunting experience. And imagine any prisoner that would have been lowered down in here with the ropes tied underneath their arms, how uncomfortable that would have been. And of course, once a prisoner got down here, they would have let the ropes up there. And so if they looked down and saw the prisoner was sleeping or something like that, they could have jerked on the rope and of course woken them up. It's just another way of torturing them. Now, there was something else that we walked past on our way down, a room that had some ropes on the side. Now, what was that? That was a place where they could have punished prisoners if they wanted to. They could have stretched them out 
with ropes tied on each arms and on each legs where they could have whipped a prisoner or done whatever they wanted to do with them. We know that Jesus was mistreated during his trials with Annas and Caiaphas. We know that they spat on him. We know that they struck him. There was more that was going to happen to him when he was turned over to Pilate and to Herod. But he wasn't treated well when he was with Annas and Caiaphas by any means. No, he wasn't. We need to try to put ourselves in Jesus' position. He's been up for a full 24 hours at this point. This is probably one of the first moments being lowered down if he were put in a place like this, where he's finally calm into himself. But how isolated he would have felt, how tired he would have felt, and how these trials were the first time during this process where they had finally physically abused him, and what that would have felt like to have been so rejected by the people he was coming to save. There's a passage over in Psalms that might help someone relate to how Jesus may have been feeling in that moment. But I, O Lord, cry out to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O Lord, why did you cast my soul away and why did you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terror as I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me, and my companions have become darkness. It's really easy to imagine Jesus feeling that way in the morning hours prior to being sent over to Pilate and to Herod as all of his apostles scattered from him and he had been mistreated and was getting ready to be sent over. Regardless of whether or not this is the exact location of where this happened, it's still a vivid reminder of everything Jesus went through for you and me. It was also during this period, just on the heels of the conclusion of the illegal trials, when Judas comes back into the story. It's my personal opinion that Judas never really anticipated that this would progress as far as it did. I think he assumed that Jesus would be able to walk away from this unscathed, really similar to how he walked through the mob that was trying to throw him off the hill in Nazareth when they rejected him there. And that when he realized that it had progressed to the point in the morning where the Sanhedrin found him guilty of blasphemy and they were going to take him to Pilate, is when he rushes back to give the money back and feels such guilt over that and they refuse to take it that he throws it at their feet and then he goes out and hangs himself. I really believe that Judas didn't think it was gonna go as far as it did. The story of Judas is interesting and sad. One of the overlooks that you have there at the church looks over the southern side of the Hinnom Valley and there is a portion of land over there that's been divided off and that's the traditional side of the field of blood. The field that was purchased with the money that Judas threw down at the priest's feet when he realized what was happening. The other thing that's interesting about Judas is the fact that we have other people during the time of Jesus' crucifixion who did things they shouldn't have. Peter denied Christ. All of the other disciples fled. However, all those other disciples came back to Jesus. Judas had that opportunity as well. He had a choice he could make. He could have easily have come back to Jesus and said, I'm sorry but he didn't. There's a lesson for all of us in that, but it's a sad lesson that we have to learn. In that one spot, you're reminded of Peter's denial, and you can see the potter's field where Judas chose a very different response to his guilt. He chose alienation from Christ and just wallowing in his guilt instead of coming back to a gracious Lord who forgave the one who denied him later on. I think it's a powerful place. When Jesus' trials at Annas and Caiaphas' palace were concluded, in the morning they took him over to the Sanhedrin to be tried there, and one of the likely places for that was at the Temple Mount behind us. Now when that trial was all wrapped up, they took Jesus over to Pilate because the Jews didn't have the authority to condemn someone to death. Now one of the likely places for that is over to a place called Herod's Palace. We went to the Kishla, which is part of the Tower of David Museum on the western side of the old city of Jerusalem, very close to the Jaffa Gate. This compound is built on top of where the palace of Herod would have been in the first century. This is the probable location of where Pilate and Herod Antipas were located during the trials of Jesus. A number of years ago in the city of Caesarea, they actually found a stone which talks about Pontius Pilate being the 
prefect of Judea, which is very interesting because of course it's an extra biblical reference that confirms what the Bible says about Pilate. It had been removed from its original site and then reused as a step in the amphitheater there in Caesarea Maritima. And there were some people that had questioned the existence of Pilate and they had questioned his role as described in the Bible. And so to find this stone that mentions that he was the prefect, which was a role they had been questioning, just helps substantiate the biblical text. This is beautiful. This is incredible. This room is called the Kishla. In the 1940s, it was a prison. But after Israel gained its independence in 1947, they were able to come in here and do some excavation works. And they found civilizations going all the way back to the first century. You can actually still see the remnants of the prison bars in the roof where they cut them out. This is really a great space. What we have at the very top are the layers from the 20th century when the prison was here. And as they began digging, they found ruins that dated back to the Crusaders in the 12th century, and then the Byzantines in the 4th and 5th century. And of course, what we're most interested in is what they found here on the very bottom, which dates back to the second temple period or the first century AD. This would be the foundation of King Herod's palace that sat here on the western side of Jerusalem. So that would be a Herodian section, dating to the same time as that first century road over by the Temple Mount. That's right. So you just keep marching down through the centuries and you get to the time of Jesus. And something that was pointed out to us is that on either side of that wall are tunnels that run in opposite directions. And knowing Herod the Great and how paranoid he was, he had built these tunnels for escape purposes, primarily to move water, but also to get away in case he needed to. So just above that was where the trial of Jesus took place. What I had always heard is that Jesus' trial before Pilate and Herod actually took place over at the Antonia Fortress connected to the Temple Mount. But you're saying that it's more likely it took place here at Herod's palace on the other side of town. Well, it is possible. That was a military barracks during the time. But it seems more natural to me that Pilate would have been here. Most of the time, he would have been ruling in Caesarea Maritima, which was the Roman administrative capital of this area. But because he's a political figure and because he wanted to be near the people, he would have been in town for the Passover. Same way with Herod Antipas. He normally would have been in Tiberias, but of course he had come to town as well. In Mark 15, it tells us that after he was arrested and taken to Annas and Caiaphas into the Sanhedrin, that he was then led to the palace, to the Praetorium, which would have been this location right here. And I think people need to realize the difference between the two spaces. Antonia Fortress is a smaller military barracks. Herod's palace here on the other side of town was a large estate. So it makes sense that the Roman governor for the area would have taken one of the largest, most beautiful places as his in-town residence when he came to Jerusalem. We also read in the scripture in Matthew 27 that Pilate's wife was here. It seems unnatural to me that she would have been over at the military barracks. She right. would have been here at the palace. Pilate knows that they're coming and he comes out of the palace to meet them. And they're trying to get him condemned before Pilate. There's a mob forming. Pilate takes Jesus back into the palace and has a dialogue with him one-on-one. -on -one. What is this about the accusation about you being the king of the Jews? And during that questioning, Pilate learns that Jesus is a Galilean. And so Pilate decides, I have found a solution. I'll give him to someone else. And so he sends him across the courtyard over to Herod Antipas. And so in verse eight, when it says, when Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. And I think we need to put ourselves in Jesus' shoes. Jesus and his family fled to Egypt to escape being put to death by Herod the Great, Herod Antipas' father. And Herod Antipas was the Herod who had killed his cousin, John the Baptist. And now he's standing in front of the killer of his cousin. And this man is really only interested in seeing Jesus perform parlor tricks. Jesus knows he's not gonna get a fair trial in front of this man. I think it helps to understand the mental pressure and anguish that Jesus was going through and the exhaustion that he was under. And then he's sent back to Pilate. His wife says, have nothing to do with this innocent man. You know, I've suffered a lot because of dreams. He performs this perverse form of mercy. He has him beaten, he has him flogged, he's mocked by the soldiers. And then he leads him back out and says, behold your king, I find no fault in him. And they still cry out for him to be crucified. 
And then they actually ramp up the charges against him over in John when he comes out and tells him, look, I don't find any guilt in him. The Jews answered, we have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself to be the son of God. Not only has he claimed to be king, but he's made himself to be divinity. And so Pilate quickly grabs Jesus, comes back into the palace, talks to him some more. And from verse 12, then on Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. And so everything is escalating. The mob is getting unruly. There's a possibility that Pilate could be charged with being against Caesar, which would be death for him. We know what happened. He ends up washing his hands and turning him over to a centurion to be crucified. One of the best views of Jerusalem, the old city, is from the top of the Lutheran Church, well over 100 steps in a winding staircase all the way up. But once you get up there, it's one of the best views of the old city of Jerusalem. How gorgeous. Yeah. I'll let you catch your breath for a second. I brought you up here because I wanted to show you something. Okay. The two blue domes are the top of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. That church sits on the traditional location of where Jesus Christ died, was buried, and arose. The big dome on the left sits on top of the edicule where they said he was buried. Mm -hmm. And the smaller dome on the right sits on top of where they think is Calvary, where he died. What a great perspective, a great view of the old city. It really is. I love coming up here and seeing this. As nice as this view is, yeah. actually there's something I want to show you that's down below the church. Below? Yes. Back down all the stairs? All the stairs. In the basement of this church are a number of things they found archaeologically. The main thing I wanted to show him was the remains of a first century garden in Jerusalem. So Mark tells us that Jesus was led out to be crucified, and then John specifies that he was still near the city. So what do both of those passages have to do with where we're standing? Interestingly enough, where we're standing is outside the city. Now how do we know that? Well, for many years, the wall behind us was thought to be the city wall from first century Jerusalem. Scholars have since changed their mind about that, but still believe that the wall came through this area somewhere. Everything on the other side of the wall would have been inside the city. Everything out would have been outside the city. And the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which we believe is the traditional location of Jesus' crucifixion, would have taken place about 200 feet in that direction. We can imagine people coming through the gate of the wall to access the point in Golgotha where Jesus was crucified. That's correct. Right in front of us, according to what I've been reading, is this shaft that goes down about 40 feet. Back in the early 70s, they did some excavation and they actually hit quarry bedrock from the time of Herod the Great. What can you tell us about the layers in this shaft? Well, you're right. Down at the very bottom, there is a quarry from the time of King Herod. He used rocks from this quarry to build the walls and the other structures inside the city. Probably another 10 to 12 feet above that is a garden layer that actually dates to the time of Jesus, so about 30 AD. And another 10 or 15 feet above that is a large section of basically residue. It was just a dumping ground during the time of Hadrian around 135 AD. So if we can imagine going back to that second layer, that layer of garden, and imagine it right up against the wall, about the wall extending down another 30, 35 feet, down to that garden layer where Jesus was led out to be crucified. It helps us imagine how large the wall was and how much history has taken place in between now and then. And it was out into that garden layer that Jesus was led to be crucified at Golgotha. What Barry was able to do for us was show us more evidence that helps us understand that our Bible and the descriptions of the crucifixion are accurate. Just in that one stop, Barry was able to point out the traditional crucifixion site of Jesus was outside the city walls. There was also a garden in that same spot, and the Bible talks about both of those things. It makes the Bible come alive to see things like that. We're on our way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. What's the route that you're taking us? We're currently on the Via Della Rosa. We're in the Muslim quarter of the old city. The Via Della Rosa is Latin for the way of sorrows. It marks the traditional path that Jesus took 
between his condemnation by Pontius Pilate and Golgotha. Now between here and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre are called the Nine Stations of the Cross. Inside you've got five for a total of 14. There are, there's a number of those stations that aren't really even biblically based. They're more traditional than anything. And the path of the Via Della Rosa has changed many times over the centuries. The current path, of course, even if it's accurate, is still about 20 feet or so higher than the first century Jerusalem. Whatever path Jesus took from Pilate to the cross, it would have been hilly the whole way, which of course is just one more layer of the suffering that he went through for all of us. It's helpful to think about what would have been going through his mind as he was led through those trials, as he was led outside the city, as he carried and dropped his cross, as Simon of Cyrene was enlisted to pick it up and carry it the rest of the way. To realize that I was near the places where those events took place and that people kept track of those locations for thousands of years because it was so important. It was a very sobering moment.